Wow, what a fantastic turnout. It shows you how well loved these artists are. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. And um, my name's Jennifer Gibson. I'm the director curator of Gallery 1CO3. Uh, the exhibition cafeteria has been up in the gallery for four weeks. And as many of you know, it started with a relational happening on March 2nd, where folks entered the space, university students and uh, some faculty too, entered the space and participated in a relational happening by eating their lunch in the space and uh, thus becoming the uh, fodder for the creation of uh, fabulous works by Elisa and Elvira. And uh, so what's going to happen tonight is that Elvira is going to speak first. She's going to show a video of one of her works and then, um, and then show some still images and talk about her practice um, as she works with salt brine and relational art practice and followed by Lisa who will give a presentation of her work. After that, we'll enter into a bit of a conversation about this project, how it came together and you know uh, what we've learned through the process together. Um, and then we'll open up to the audience for Q&A. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce you to the artist for those who, because there are some folks here who maybe don't know Elvira and Lisa. Um, so Elvira Finnegan uh, studied at the University of Manitoba. She's uh, lived in a number of places and, and carried out a number of careers, including teaching visual art, and uh, has carried out her own art, art practice. I want to say more intensively in the last, what, 20 years, would you say? More, more intensively in the last 20 years and uh, has worked with, uh, with salt brine since 2001 as a, as a medium and as a, as a method. And Elvira has um, worked with around food-based installations for a number of years. I want to say four or five years, approximately, yeah. And uh, Lisa also studied at the University of Manitoba. Lisa did her undergraduate degree at U of M, and then she went on and did an MFA at Yale University. And uh, Lisa has also uh, ha worn different hats in the arts over the years. Of course, right now she's a programming coordinator at MAWA. And um, Lisa, I, I sort of consider Lisa, I, I recognize Lisa primarily as a painter, although we'll come to see through their presentations, and of course, you know, you would have seen in the exhibition space uh, that both their practices really uh, straddle different boundaries in terms of the media that they work with. So um, it's been a real pre pleasure working with them, and I think I'll stop talking now <laughs> and just pass it over to Elvira to, uh, to speak, so thanks. I want to begin by showing a video. It's uh, uh, one that I completed in two, uh, 2014. And the video is based on uh, the tea party that I um, staged in my studio in 2008. Okay, here we go. Will you have tea? Thank you, my dear. That was my last tea party. Oh. I 
the go smell the ocean. They say the ocean smelled different. They smell differently in the west and the east. Yeah. yeah. Very good program. No, I didn't do that. Thank you. Yeah. That's where the a different country. I've never been in Canada. I've never been overseas. I'd like to get up. Thought it would be. Would you have tea? No, I brought my own tea. Ah, oh, you've brought some tea. Yeah. That's what Rose was saying. Yeah. Okay. I, I brought some sage tea to ah, share with them. Is that oh. the one in the other? Sage tea? I do not know sage tea. The women have to go pick it every spring. They will go pick it and um, do prayer, pick it. Oh. And it's used in sun dances, fudgy. Smudging is a purification. It's like an incense in a church, like you see the yes. yeah, yes. the smoke. Men can it has Men such can. a wonderful flavor. <laughs> 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 what did you do? Oh, the conversation and the laughter. So delicious. She left. They have all left. She filled it all with salt water.
what I wanted to say. I wanted to thank you all for coming here. <laughs> and just to let you know that I wanted to show the video also because it was one of those things where I had distilled a lot of my ideas about the Tea Party and the passage of time. I was able to collaborate with a lot of people to create it. Um, I'd especially like to thank, um, I think Michael is here, who helped a lot with all the technical part, and Susan Chafe, who did the uh, sound piece, and a lot of the performers are here as well, so thank you very much for attending this as well. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, present a little bit of a, an overview of some of the work that I have done in the past. Um, Okay, here we go. All oh, right, yay. <laughs> I'm learning this machine. I don't know it too well, so it's kind of a, uh, something else. So I want to just talk about uh, the installations I have done with salt brine since um, 2006, which was the first one. So this first one was called um, Pleiades, and it was held in the Ace Art Project Room in 2006 in the winter. And this was my first large scale installation. I had been experimenting with uh, salt brine since 2001. And in this one I laid out various size bowls in the shape of the Pleiades constellation, the Seven Sisters. And within the various bowls I put various objects. These had sort of um, they were related to stories or um, beliefs or they were symbols. And so, for example, I had um, pennies in one of them and people threw the pennies into the bowl. So it turned out like you throw wish make wishes by throwing pennies in a bowl. Uh, very old idea. And over time, you can see it's, it created a splash on the surface around the, the whole thing. And over time, the pennies turned turquoise, which is, were quite stunning. And the, the salt leached out of the bowl and kind of created its own map or drawing form. I called it automatic drawing. Um, this is also um, where I started working with uh, some food. I had some food items in this particular show. And people were worried that they, they wouldn't be preserved. But sure enough, they, they were preserved. And it also kind of twigged the idea that maybe a dinner party would be a great idea to create um, a, a salt installation with the dinner party. So I, I was working on that at the same time. Um, part of the idea, the ideas that came to me through that work of, uh, with the installation was um, the idea of the formation of the earth. Christ the earth is made up of crystals. Salt has been on the earth since the beginning of time. It's in the, in the uh, ocean, it's in our bodies, um, it's under the earth as well. Um, I also was thinking about galaxies and stars and in the big bowls when the uh, crystals of uh, salt are forming, they kind of form almost like constellations and they move on the surface as the time changes. And um, then, uh, and while I was doing this other installation, this the other piece, we also had a camera, a time-lapse camera going and it was the day, very early days of uploading a webcam. So we actually had images being uploaded onto the website and people could see this very dim pictures of what was actually happening, but it was quite exciting to us. Simultaneously, I had a, a camera trained on one bowl like the pennies in my studio at home, and this was also a, a time-lapse photography also uploaded onto my website, and then we created a, a time-lapse video, which is still on my website, saltwatch.com. So um, it really talks a lot to the passage of time and was something where I was very pleased with how it all worked. So here are some of the food uh, transformations, uh, the same bowl with the apples and the cheese and the, and the um, crackers in it. And um, I went on to do another project called Time Lapse. And this is something that was actually just a website project. And it occurred on, the, um, um, on my website, but what I did we did was in a home studio was set up uh, a camera over these bowls and took time lapse for a month, a month and a half, and they were collated. And they were there. We have some very nice archives, or I have very nice archive on my website under time lapse, and I also created seven videos, which are really in the end meditations. When you watch them, they kind of just change very slowly. So um, my next uh, work was the one you're familiar with, Tea Party's Over. 
And this was kind of a lot of fun because it was began, began as sort of a performance tea party. Um, I invited my friends who were so kind to <coughs> participate and uh, they each adopted some kind of a character as much as they were comfortable with. And Diane Whitehouse was Vivian who became this uh, hostess with the most. As you hear her uh, voice over, she speaks with a fine British accent, and it really was a, a very, very uh, fun event. Um, at that time, it was in my studio, and again, it was another web project, and this ha um, there was one camera from above, you know, like in cooking shows, you see the camera up above, and there was time lapse happening of the event and of the salt as it evaporated, etc. And there was another one from this angle. So what you're seeing here was another angle of camera. And that was running for about, um, about almost two and a half, three months. After that, we came in, Bill Eakin and myself came in and took still photos. And we have some, uh, this is one example of it. They were made into prints and they were shown um, at this uh, cultural center along with my exhibition uh, that followed this one. Um, to me, this brought in ideas of, um, the, the changing, the, you know, you try to pre preserve things uh, historically, etc. And at one time, the idea of having a good set of fine china and knowing how to have a very formal tea party was a, kind of something uh, at least every woman was supposed to know how to do. Um, it, it came a point where that's kind of been tossed aside and I could buy all the dishes, the very fine Wedgwood dishes in a um, secondhand store for $30. People don't do these elaborate tea parties very much anymore. And uh, then I also went into a little bit more research and I discovered how important tea and the china and all the accoutrements were to the British, um, British Empire uh, for creating uh, a colonial kind of system here in Canada. And I have lived in Africa and certainly tea was very important and fine china was used there as well if you, you know, could afford it. And so it was something kind of almost worldwide in the colonies that tea and uh, china became very important. But that wasn't the only thing. Salt was a very important part of British uh, trade and other countries as well. And we know the story of Gandhi walking his followers to the ocean to create, um, uh, to get their own salt and sugar. Those are all tied in. And then slaves, which I don't think anybody talks about. It's sort of the whole idea of the trade, but not the, the underbelly of that kind of thing as well. So um, this was my uh, still from the, uh, it, the performance, the dinner event at the CCFM, the uh, Franco Manitoba Cultural Center. It was called Festin et Consequences, and I need somebody who can really speak French to say that, or Feast and Aftermath. There were 14 um, established, published Franco Manitoban artists who write poetry, uh, novels, um, uh, various kind of books. They've all been published. They meet on a regular basis. They're very comfortable with each other, and they help put together this wonderful meal. The plan of this was to almost create a 60s, 70s kind of uh, dinner where the you know fine china had been tossed aside in favor of pottery or dark colored things and wine drinking became more prevalent. It was something that was done a bit but we all kind of adopted it with gusto and I think this is a good example of it. <laughs> and at the end there was a video, a time lapse video taken of this or still and made into a video which was posted in the show as well. And of course the table evolved over time. And I like the, the, the video, which is very similar to what's downstairs, because it was the life of the event followed by the stillness and the, oh, you know, decay and then the preservation of what the table was all about. And here are some examples of some of the terrific things that happened. Uh, a lot of icicles were formed. And um, the, this was uh, Winnipeg gold eye. And I um, also salted the papers and writings that people did. Um, here's another lovely view of the uh, a plate setting from uh, very white and clean. People ate in very different ways, which was interesting to see. And it also reminds me of, you know, old still life paintings, etc. And I think Lisa and I have that in common with our interest in that ideas. So here's some of the uh, things. Um, I, I might just go back to uh, this particular one. Some of the ideas that this one created was um, the idea of, of life and, and it's, it's motion and the stillness is behind. And in fact, these still images were 
fresher than the video because the video preceded it. And that's kind of an interesting thing where time gets warped in a little way. That's something that uh, I've kind of been working with quite a bit. And I also think with uh, salting the books and papers, um, I, it was reminded of the, uh, it's almost a metaphor of what happened here in Manitoba in 1890 when uh, the French language was banned in the schools and there was a big attempt to uh, eliminate the language um, spoken and written and used in, in Manitoba. And this was kind of on the new immigrants who were from Ontario mainly who were quite against uh, the French and what they stood for. So it kind of um, highlighted that part of, of our, our poor history here too. Now I'll go to the next one. A year ago exactly, pretty well, a, a little bit in February, um, I did a pop-up installation in the pop-up restaurant on the river, the raw almond pop-up restaurant. Um, this uh, was actually quite a fun event. I ended up doing it on the last day that the tent was up and created um, um, an installation running down the center of one of the very rough kind of tables. This happened at noon at minus 20 below. What I had done instead of using salt brine is I created ice boats that were somewhat the shape of a, um, a York boat. And the beaver pelts that you see there that look were created from a fur coat. So I was trying to bring back some history and some ideas. And then I poured salt on top of each of the um, of the uh, ice boats, knowing that eventually these would melt and um, create brine as well. So uh, that evening there was a party, and it was for the chefs and the servers who were there. It was had a, a real kind of great atmosphere, and the lights were kind of fantastic, and they put in a lot of heat into that tent, which I was surprised at. And this hot heat kind of got everything going at a much quicker rate. So the salt was melting away and the heat was melting away and the brine was happening. This poor little beaver lying there. <laughs> and it, each, it went so far as to actually start crystallizing that very evening on the tables. Um, so that was quite amazing. Um, I think uh, what I, the t oh here, we'll pass on. The tent came down the next day and this is what was left from the, sh the show before. And I just want to show some of the patterns of the ice and what was left. And I actually took that show down a day later. I was, had no idea how long it would actually stay up. Um, and this one, I just kind of got the, you know, was trying to talk about the idea of the rivers, how important they were to fur trade, how important uh, animals, um, the, by converting fur coats, which had been, you know, Winnipeg was a center for for furs and for making fur coats when I was a young person. And that's, you know, it still happens a little bit, but there's just not uh, part of the life that happens for us here. So it was kind of a, a little bit. And then, uh, you know, there's kind of the, the reference to the female genitalia, which has been mentioned to me on a number of times. So that's another kind of thing that, oh yeah, of course, that's how that would be there as well. And then I'm, I've come to my, uh, the last one here. This is the last um, uh, Brian piece that I've been working at. And um, I, when I eat in cafeterias of different places, I've always, often noticed the, the detritus that's staying on the table and I'm like, boy, I'd really like to salt that. I think that would look really fabulous. So when Jennifer and I were talking, um, I said, well, what about working with a cafeteria? Instead of saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> She said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. So that's sort of part of the, I was really pleased that it was welcomed in this man. This is the beginning. Some of you weren't there in the beginning to see how it looked. There's still quite a bit of liquid. This was day two. There was quite a bit of liquid in a number of the bowls. The tables were starting to, um, uh, things on the table were already crystallizing. Uh, here's some of the close-ups of, and I'm just showing you a few things, things that were uh, not quite done yet, but it went fairly quickly in the room. And what I found kind of interesting is that uh, there's all these um, packaging that actually lent a lot of color to the exhibition. And it was um, a really, really good thing about that. This show has very, been very interesting for me because it, it ha was a great unknown. I didn't have any control over who came, what kind of dishes really were going to be brought to the table, what meals were going to be brought to the table. Um, and, you know, comfort foods, which they university cafeteria does make tends to be kind of brown and beige quite a bit and so wasn't sure how that would all all um, play out 
But um, I, I, I'm finding it very, very interesting. It's raising a lot of questions. It was great to work with Lisa. She's brought something completely different to the whole idea of uh, the, the dinner. And I, I know that I'm at the beginning of a, a train of thought that will carry me through the next year and hopefully provide some really great ideas for the show next year. So thank you very much. Okay.